Um, its design also is slightly different. Uh, there are there are armors shown that have a effectively um, one suit of armor with a breastplate and a backplate separately that covers the the the, the joint. So that the 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 suit of armor is made so it's easy to move in, but extra protective pieces are put on top. Uh, in, in fact, the one case of this that I've uh, I've looked at, uh, which is quite spectacular because there are monster figures um, uh, at the belt level grasping the belt, and and it's very decorative armor. Uh, this is actually a rear opening armor. Uh, it's shown quite clearly. Uh, that way because of the fact that the um, monster mouth at the bottom of the breastplate is holding the belt and the arrangement of the plaques on the belt tell you it's the front of the belt. Uh, so uh, even though I think it would be very rare for a soldier to have a back opening armour, in this case it, there was a back opening armour, it had a groin guard built into it, uh, it's shown with the skirts diverging like that. Uh, I think possibly to indicate that they were close together at the top. This could be just an artistic thing. I don't know. It's speculation. It's not really worth worrying about uh, until we find a text that explains it, which it might. But um, but the thing is that the back opening was covered by the back plate. So you put on the first part of the armour, it was done up the back, and then the breastplate and the back plate were tied together, put over the head, and uh, done up around the waist with loops and and uh, and uh, cords and whatever. Uh, this is clearly a uh, an armor for somebody fairly important, and also clearly an armor that could not be put on by itself. Uh, the other armors, and and the, the the they they describe the armors in the Chinese text as body armor, and uh, and uh, and shirt, which is the top part of the armor, like where I had a neck guard with the shoulders attached. Uh, they had the shoulders and a uh, part that came down over the chest partly that was tied around under the arms. Um, this is this is often uh, attempted to be reproduced in uh, in uh, modern um, say uh, illustrations for war gaming and things like that. But uh, it's it's not very easy to understand the original drawings or, or prints. These were woodblock. Um, printed editions, uh, so it's pretty hard to actually follow what's going on, and it doesn't match any of the paintings, so or any of the um, say. There's quite a lot of religious um, art showing people in lamellar armour in China, and it, it it doesn't match those either. But it it has to be said that most of those show a degree of um, what would you call it? it? It's it's not imaginary armour. It's just that armour is dressed up to look more impressive than you would expect. The, the, the armour that's been dug up has been really, really practical. Uh, whereas the armour that's shown in, in uh, paintings and whatever seems to be very um, excessively detailed, I think is one way of putting it. This is not the case in, in the uh, illustrations from the Ilkhanid paintings uh, in, in Iran. Though later paintings from uh, the uh, Jalairid period, immediately after the fall of the Ilkhanids, and the early Timurid period do show some fairly excessive decoration. And one has to wonder whether it was um, an artistic development of the painting rather than a technical development of the armour. Other pieces of armour are shown in detail that make it possible to recognise where hinges went in in hand uh, in hand armor, they weren't technically gauntlets all the time. Sometimes they were. Sometimes they had articulated fingers. Uh, so you know, it would be it would be premature at this stage to say, oh, definitely it was done this way or done that way. But it's it's a uh, it's worthwhile studying. So far, I found that um, when we made the first armors. Uh, we used a uh, what was uh, scales collected in in an area that's um, probably now part of North Korea. 
at the time it would have been a heavily Kitan influenced area uh, Kitan being a um, side branch of the Mongolian uh, uh, family tree uh, which spoke what appears to have been a I wouldn't call it a proto-Mongolian language but a language that was early on in the development of uh, Mongolia and they had a um, a, a, a structure that was say halfway between a, a Mongolian uh, steppe culture and a and a Jurchen uh, forest culture. Uh, so, but they they were quite successful in the uh, pre uh, Jurchen period when the Mongols started fighting the Jurchens to conquer North China. Uh, uh, quite a few prominent Kitan um, people changed sides and in fact the uh, Chinggis Khan's uh, councillor and Ergodai's councillor uh, Yele Chutsi um, was a, a Kitan nobleman uh, so the, this this kind of penetration you, you, you can see this connection and I'm making gestures here which you can't see you can see this connection between East Asian military technology and what happened when say the Mongols got to Iran. Now there is some material suggesting that the in, in, in the Persian cultural area that a lot of the Mongol equipment wasn't that innovative or strange. Uh, the problem is that the period of the Mong the first um, uh, appearance of Chinggis Khan and and uh, the subsequent conquest by uh, Hulegu, uh, the the um, this is a bad time for things like carbon fourteen dating. It's it's there's a very wide range on the possible dates. I'm not quite sure why. I've looked up the calibrations. They're not real. They're not real precise. Um, so uh, things can be excavated and they can fall in a range, but you can't say which part of the range they're from. And the range can be 60, 70 years, and in 60, 70 years, lots of things happen. My general feeling about this particular lamellar armour that, uh, that I demonstrated earlier is that uh, while it's a slightly archaic design, um, it gave roughly the same degree of protection. Uh, with properly hardened leather, that leather is quite hard, but it's it's not at the uh, highest level. Um, you get two benefits. Um, one is because you're using thick material as opposed to metal plates. There's a bigger buffer um, for things like mass weapon strikes, um, like being hit by a mace or something like that. You, you're actually better protected. Um, Lamella generally flexes when it's hit by a solid object like that so that, that's a benefit of all lamellar armour but the thicker leather lamellar armour is, uh, is particularly good at shock absorption. Hardened leather, properly hardened leather is very cut resistant. Something that I found out when I did some experiments a while ago was the other thing that you wouldn't think is it's very um, water resistant in the sense of not that it repels water but leather normally, if you want to change its shape, you can soften it in water and, and then let it dry out and it takes whatever shape you've left it in. Uh, when you um, harden leather, it doesn't do that anymore. It, uh, it's very difficult to change its shape and it becomes quite springy. So um, I'm not... Uh, I, the, the, one of the problems that they talk about with composite bows is moving from a dry climate to a wet climate. You're going to have a lot of problems. Now, Iran is got lots of nice arid areas which are quite dry but it also has lots of mountains and uh, and certainly in the north where the Mongols didn't penetrate very successfully Mazandaran and Gilan and that uh, it gets very very wet and uh, probably the reasons that the Mongols weren't very successful there is the same reason that they had problems with jungles and things like that everywhere um, their, their, their mode of warfare is not very well suited to uh, fighting in dense foliage in high humidity and high temperatures. It's just not real good. And uh, nobody really liked fighting that way except for the people that lived there because they knew they could keep their land under control. So that's basically um, 
what uh, I wanted to add to putting that armor on. Uh, as you can see, uh, a man of my age getting into armor he made 30 years ago, or 35 years ago, however long ago it was, isn't that easy. The armor itself is very forgiving and, and quite flexible. And uh, actually putting it on after all these years uh, has um, suggested a few improvements to the design. Uh, one is when I first did it, this is not in the video that, that we're publishing, I put it on like a, you'd put on a t-shirt or something and found that the um, individual rows were catching not so much on my well-rounded front but on my back and of course you can't reach back very easily and do anything because you're basically in a straitjacket. And it only occurred to me that some of the things that uh, people do, um, and I, I did in, in some of the other armors, uh, would mitigate that just simply by having a strap that's attached at the bottom of each row so that they couldn't flip up and cause trouble. And I'm going to actually try that out to see if it's any easier. Uh, the other thing that uh, I've been um, looking at is... Uh, the I've concentrated mainly on lamellar, and and the, the major difference in the lamellar scales is not so much their breadth or their length, it's where the hole is that that the next row hangs from. So if it's up near the top of the scale, you have a lot of exposed lace, like in Japanese armor, or in fact in that armor, which has a lot of exposed lace. Uh, if it's down towards the bottom, you lose a lot of flexibility, but on the, the good side there's less lace that exp that's exposed now I doubt that anyone went into battle slashing horizontally to cut the laces because once you put that armor on it doesn't really move each band individually attaches itself to your body and your clothing or your any armor you're wearing under it like mail or something like that it doesn't slide around when you took it off it might fall apart but while they're actually wearing it and fighting they could cut 90% of the laces and the thing it still stay together. They're really, really uh, quite good at that. So, I, uh, I mean, it's the maintenance that's the real problem with lamellar. Those laces, whether they're leather or silk or cotton or hemp, they're the things that you've got to worry about. And uh, I think uh, the gradual abandonment of lamellar armour was due to the fact that it was basically easier once you had large production uh, facilities, as they did in, in Iran or China, to make other armors that were um, easier to store. This is really important. I mean, male armor is an absolute dream. Put it in a barrel with some grease and it'll last for several hundred years. Um, just replace a few straps. Uh, the brigandine that was popular in from end to end of Eurasia. Uh, also, it just has to be treated like clothes. The, the, the Chinese, when they made brigandine, they lacquered the um, metal scales to make them waterproof. Um, Europeans didn't really do that, but European brigandine still survive. Uh, as long as the fabric survives, you can tell them they're, they're, they're brigandines. I mean, there's... Uh, uh, Sherbourg Castle and things like this. All kinds of uh, areas where uh, Brigandine have survived. So the reason that I think Lamela basically died out was this problem of maintenance. The place where, the two places where it survived, uh, Tibet and Japan in large amounts and um, uh, far western China, uh, are places which have rather unique uh, uh, problems. In one case, in Tibet, the cold and the dry mean that leather lacing lasts forever. I mean, they've excavated lamellar armour where the lacing was still flexible because it was so cold and dry, the leather didn't rot, everything was fine. In Japan, with high humidity and that where they use silk lacing, they lacquered all the scales and the uh, and sometimes before they lacquered them they wrapped part of them with leather and 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 glued it down with lacquer and then lacquered the whole thing so the result was that the silk aside from insect damage and damage from uv light from sunlight lasted quite a long time the lacquered scales lasted quite a long time if you have a look at their um, male like the kuzuzuri and that this is in 
basically disintegrates. The, uh, the rust, even when the, the individual rings and loops are, are, are lacquered, the, the, the way that mail works, the rings rub against each other and rub the lacquer off, and you end up with a, um, a thing exposed to high humidity, and it rusts. I've, I've handled a few old Japanese armors, and uh, the one part that's always the most damaged is the mail, kuzazuri. So uh, perhaps the survival of lamella in certain circumstances was related to climate and um, the ease of maintenance and its demise in other areas was related to the opposite. So uh, lamella was never big in Europe. Um, the last surviving bits of lamella, uh, for instance, the, the Wisby finds, or Visby as we should probably pronounce it, the Visby finds are clearly reused lamellar armour and the scale pattern is a type used in the Byzantine Empire and the western part of the Sasanian Empire in, in the later period. So almost certainly this stuff came up through Russia into uh, Gotland and um, strips of it were just riveted inside to make brigandine. Uh, the, the, the placement of where the bits were and everything are related to the fact that they were riveted into a brigandine, not to the way the armour was originally put together. So you can sometimes be misled by archaeology if you don't pay attention to the details and think, oh yeah, we, we have these rows of lamellar over the shoulders and all this. It, possibly, but they probably weren't used for structural support rather than just for protection. Uh, so. I hope this has been useful. Uh, the details of the two books will be in the description of the video, so that uh, if you want to look them up, you can. These, uh, the paintings themselves, are widely available on the internet. Um, uh, I must admit that uh, 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 Yang Hong's book has so much detail in it uh, that if you ever see a copy, it's worthwhile getting uh, because of the fact that. Uh, this is just like a treasure trove uh, and nobody, if you're interested in lamellar, nobody should uh, ignore what keeps on being dug up in China. The fact that lamellar has been dug up in Iran from the uh, late Sasanian period shows that maybe in the future we'll find more material. There's some very strange laminated armors that have turned up uh, from Syria uh, that show some of the detailing that we see in much later paintings like late Jalirid paintings and early Timurid paintings though the carbon dates put them somewhere between 1200 and 1350 I think something like that um, you could take the earlier dates or take the later dates depending on what other material you're comparing them with but I would say in general if you want to uh, learn about Lama uh, for existing suits, go to the Metropolitan Museum of Art when people can travel and have a look at the Tibetan ones there because every method of putting a lamellar armour together is on show and even a few that nobody knew about until some of these armours turned up. And there's actually there's another book which I can I think I can find. Um, got too many books. Uh, can't pull it out straight away, but uh, Himalayan Warriors, um, which is a Metropolitan Museum of Art publication, uh, it has very detailed photographs and very detailed descriptions and, and discussions of lamellar armour, and it's it's a great resource for anyone. Uh, the um, internal and external photographs of existing lamellars is remarkable and if you can't get the book go to the Metropolitan Museum of Art's website uh, they have individual photographs of lamellar armour of lamellar scales with bits of lacing still attached uh, that you can just download for free and they are fascinating they show on some lamellar scales the pre-marking of the holes so that you get the matching holes they um, 
the, the, the ones of the full suits show things like the um, uh, curving in of the scales around the waist so when you put your belt on it didn't slip down your armour or catch on the tops of the next row below. Uh, you may have noticed when I was putting that armour on that the, the, the uh, waist scales are in fact curved. That wasn't built in, that was from wearing it. Um, so, but when you make it out of metal, of course, you, you build it in. And uh, so I, I think that uh, there's a lot of resources out there. Uh, a lot of the material on, say, YouTube and that is very interesting, but a lot of it was done a long time ago, uh, and uh, it, it was, pro it's probably not as up to date as some of the things that are going on now. Anyway, thank you uh, for watching, and uh, I hope this has uh, helped you in your study.